Proving Grounds group where we pair uh, first time speakers with all season ones and they kind of work together to help the new speaker present their first talk. So community involvement is really important to me. Uh, I also do work with DEF CON in their workshops group. And outside of that, because I hate free time and money, I am working on my grad degree <laughs> in industrial and organizational psychology. So what I do is instead of focusing on social engineering and stuff like that, I try to think of ways to help our users be more secure using uh, principles of psychology. So this talk, just so you know, is more of a high level strategic talk than a low level technical talk. What if it's a picture of a screen? And it's called Cost of Putting to Compliance. So that's a nice title, but what does that mean? In my group, this, uh, we work for Rapid7, a group of us, called the Strategic Advisory Services Group. And what we do is we go out to a different customer each week or so and try to get an idea of what their overall security maturity looks like. We look at things like uh, penetration testing, incident response, application security, uh, asset and uh, software management, all that kind of good stuff. And what we see time and time again is that there's a disparate focus on priorities. A lot of times executives, directors of security, things like that focus on compliance and wanting to be compliant instead of security. A matter of fact, I would say easily nine times out of 10, what gets us in the door in the first place is a compliance need. This could be HIPAA, PCI, NERC SIP, what have you. And it's kind of an uphill battle that we need to talk about, you know, why they need to be more secure instead of just being compliant. Um, just so I get an idea of who's in the room, how many of you all are in a manager or higher capa uh, work capacity? All right, cool. Um, how many of you work in compliance? All right, uh, more technical or, uh, all right, cool. I know there's several of you who are like raising your hands for everything and that's kind of how our field works, right? <laughs> we have to wear many hats. Um, and another question I have is, what is the most significant driver behind your security program and your spending? Uh, raise your hand if it's protection of sensitive data. All right. Regulatory compliance. Reducing incidents and breaches. A little fewer hands, okay. And protection of intellectual property. Ish, yeah. So this doesn't really surprise me. It's pretty in line with what the SANS um, spending survey in 2016 found. About 65% or so um, respondents said the protection of sensitive data was their biggest concern and biggest driver for security spending, quickly followed up by compliance. And then after compliance, there's about a 20% gap between that and everything else. And I would say this is really typical for what I see when I go out to a client. Um, most of them in the boardroom are going to say, yeah, you know, you say that I need to get rid of administrative credentials, but that sounds like a pain and I don't want to do it. They don't understand why it's important or they push back and they say, well, I never heard of any of my uh, peers and other companies get breached by that. And on the other hand, when I tell them, oh, hey, you know, PCI says you need to get rid of administrative privileges, they're like, okay, let's do it. PCI says we have to do it. And it makes it made me stop and think when I started writing this talk or thinking about doing this talk, why? Why do they do this? Um, and I'll get more into it later, but it's mostly because compliance is our path of least resistance, right? It's the easiest way to get things done. And best of all, they get a little piece of paper that they can take to their customers and say, we're secure. We're protecting your data. We're doing a good job. The auditor came, told us we're doing really well. Oh, crap. 29% of survey respondents um, from that survey spending said that um, they were still compliant, or they were not, or yeah, 29% 
were still compliant after they received their attestation. So what that means is about 71% of those folks who were taking the survey, they got their paper and then maybe they forgot to scan for a couple of extra months. Or maybe their developers have ac full access to production, dev, and test. And that brings us back to that path of least resistance thing. It's nice, and we see it as a necessary evil, but we need to change the way that we do things, specifically how we report metrics to the folks in charge. <clears throat> um, a lot of times, and you know, I work for Rapid7, so I'm gonna get some like laughs and jabs over this one. A lot of times salespeople, when they talk to CISO, CEOs, or people who have purchasing power, is they rely on FUD, fear, uncertainty, and death, in order to make that sale. They're like, oh, if you don't buy our product, uh, a hacker will get in and hell will break loose, and it'll be awful, right? And that works for a little bit, but then people will get numb to that. They don't respond to it after a while. So what we need to do instead is come up with meaningful metrics that we can take to those C-level folks, to our directors, in order to justify our security program and the spending that we're making. And we need to do so regularly. And going back to that SANS annual spending survey, they asked them, what metrics do you use to um, evaluate the effectiveness of your security spending. And number one is compliance. They're like, oh, well, you know, we spent this much money on security, but we're PCI compliant, we're HIPAA compliant, e uh, KPMG isn't gonna come knocking on our doors. Fewer look at things like reduced breaches or incident response. A lot of them, or a lot of folks who are compliant with a lot of these frameworks, they don't know um, first of all, if they've been breached or how to react when they've been breached. And that's a huge problem that we have in our industry. So we need to find a way to explain um, why we need security spending, how we can track it without relying on uh, fear, uncertainty, and death. And one way to do that is using something like um, a security maturity model. So this is a sample of one that we use. Uh, it's loosely based on the Carnegie Mellon maturity model. I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with that. It goes from preliminary all the way up to innovating. And honestly, I have never had a customer in the three years I've been with this company that have reached predictable or innovating. I would also not expect any of my customers to reach that level unless they were co uh, defense contractors. A lot of times it's not necessary. What I want them to be at, or where I want them to be at, is at a managed or standardized level. I want them to have skills and training, maybe some tools in place that they know how to use effectively, maybe a third party that they're leveraging uh, to supplement what they lack, good processes and policies that they're actually following. I've seen some really good documentation that sits on a SharePoint somewhere and then they're never looked at or seen again, even by the InfoSec folks. And standardization and centralization. Everybody needs to be able to do the same thing the same way every time in order to uh, help reduce risk. Where compliance stops is about the initial level. So I get a lot of surprise looks when I go out to customers and I tell them, uh, you're about at a preliminary or initial level, and they fight me tooth and nail. How can this be? We are HIPAA compliant. We've been HIPAA compliant for years. We meet all of the requirements. The auditors tell us we're doing well. How can this be? Well, you don't send your developers to training, right? You fight them for PTO to go to things like AppSec or their local OWASP meetings. You buy all of these shiny new tools, but nobody knows how to use it. Or they're poorly implemented. And they don't know how to effectively respond to an incident. So an example that I like to talk about when I do um, a discussion like this is 
uh, I had a customer, one of my first customers when I was in this, when I got into this group that I codenamed all in the family. So we use code names in our group because it's easier to talk with each other about customers without saying the actual customer's name. So all in the family was a really tight knit family run and operated or owned and operated business. And what they did was uh, they uh, handled sales calls for other larger companies. And <clears throat> one of their larger customers um, said that they had to be SOC 2 compliant and PCI compliant. And they're like, oh, well, we're PCI compliant. We've fi filled out this questionnaire thing for years. We're doing great. We just need Rapid7 in to help us with SOC because we don't understand it. So about three of us went in, started talking with their people, read over their documentation uh, or lack thereof. We asked them for a data flow diagram. They kind of looked at us like, what you talking about? What's that? So we had to do a whiteboard exercise. And we found out, no, you're not PCI compliant in the slightest. You're nowhere near being SOC 2 compliant. And you're basing, or you're missing some of the most basic security controls that we would expect you to have with an organization your size. So we got together and sat and talked and tried to find a metaphor that would work for them because essentially what we were finding was they can't see the forest through the trees. They're so hyper-focused on compliance that they're missing some of the more basic things like knowing what assets you have and where they're located. What kind of sensitive data do you have? What data is important to your organization? How does that flow through your network? Um, what kind of basic permissions do your applications have? That sort of thing. And <clears throat> they just weren't in a place where they could start creating a comprehensive security program. So we needed to kind of start at square one for them, even though they were, they've been around for 20, 30 years. And what we did was we talked to them and we were like, okay, you need to focus on security. And by focusing on security, you will also become compliant with these things. It'll just kind of naturally fall into place. Because what a lot of folks don't grasp is that compliance tells you you have to build a gate. And this gate has to be made out of this sort of material, this certain type of material. It has to be a certain height and width and it has to have a lock on it. But what security tells you is you have to have a fence attached to the gate, and that fence has to wrap around the entire perimeter of your organization. So what does that unattached gate look like for most of us who are trying to attain PCI compliance? Well, um, in the latest version of PCI, it says any administrative non-console non access, as well as any remote access into cardholder data has to have multi-factor authentication. And it seems pretty straightforward, right? If you have Suzy Q and HR or whatever needing to remote in and access the cardholder data, she needs to authenticate twice, you know? But a lot of people don't really understand what multi-factor authentication is, and they think, well, if she has to log in twice with her username and password, that's good enough. That's, that's two factors. <laughs> no, that's one factor twice, <laughs> right? So you have to explain to them multi-factor is like something you know and something you have. And that's why, or something you do, yeah. So that's why 39% of compromised companies um, were breached through insecure remote access. They might have multi-factor in place. They might have, uh, they might have bought tokens for everybody to use or say, hey, you have to use um, the Google 2FA app, but it might not be properly implemented. Or they might do the two password thing and they use the same password for both accounts and that's how they get breached. And this is why things like Target happen why somebody can be compliant at one point in time and check the box and then later on be at the center of a major breach. Because what a lot of people don't realize is that there's no easy button in security. There's no quick fix that we can implement 
that will protect all of our data with one fell swoop and it'll be cheap and easy to implement and nobody will need to fix it or update it or yell at the vendor or anything like that. So we buy these tools, we make these investments, but we do so poorly and our easy button becomes a self-destruct button. So we talked about, and I'm talking really, really fast. So if you guys have questions in the middle, yeah, please, please do. Kind of back to your gauge analogy there. Yeah. Um, I feel like the, the overall environment, you've probably seen this in a number of clients where a client's tail is wagging the security dog, you know, where organizations become so focused on compliance, they forget why they're doing it in the first place, and it's to be more secure. And while compliance may be a good stick to go beat more money out of the executive, mm -hmm. it's not why you should fundamentally be, fundamentally, fundamentally be doing stuff. So, I mean, do you see that a mind shift has, has to happen? Because in my view, as a security practitioner, mm -hmm. a compliance person, like if you do a good job of security, you're going to be compliant. Absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree more. And it's kind of a culture shift, right? It's kind of like when you go from saying, oh, we can have six character passwords and you can reuse it for after two or three times versus, you know, strong, secure passwords. You have to explain why. Why is security more important than compliance? How can A lead to B? And it really depends on the person that you're talking to. I find that I have more luck with the CISO when I talk to them about compliance versus security. Uh, the CFO and the COO, and actually a lot of times the CEO will fight me because they will be like, oh, well, no, because if I'm not PCI compliant and we get breached, it's my name in the paper. What they don't realize is well, even if you're PCI compliant and you get breached, your name's still going in the paper. So if you spend the time, effort, and money on security first, the likelihood of you having to go through that instant response scenario of you talking to the papers is greatly reduced. And also, a lot of them don't see how security helps the business. A lot of folks view us as a cost center and leave it at that. What they need to realize is we're kind of like in an insurance policy. We're here to help them make sure that they don't get breached. Chances are, you know, based on everything that comes out, they are going to get breached. So we also have to let them know, well, yeah, we might get breached, but we also have processes, people, and tools in place to quickly address that. Yeah, and that, so that's another problem we have. Uh, in security, we kind of have a people problem. We're kind of like the guy in office space where we're like, we're a people person, damn it, but we're not. <laughs> we, 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 it's hard to find a way to ex express our jobs to a person who doesn't get it. So I think that's something that we as a community really need to work on and address is how to more effectively communicate with the business, even though it's hard and it can sometimes suck. A lot of times sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions? No? Okay. But yeah, just a reminder, again, I talk really fast, so if you do have a question or want me to go back, just let me know. It's fine. I won't be offended. But yeah, a lot of folks focus on the compliance tree completely ignore the rest of the forest, end up to the path of destruction. That's why, you know, the gingerbread house, Hansel and Gretel, kind of cutesy, a little dramatic, but I think it's a really good metaphor for what I see a lot of times. Um, I had another customer who I could named Red Rover, and what they do is they house data for a large number of companies, and they also provide, or provide, provide uh, security services for a lot of organizations, things like uh, log management and aggregation, incident response to a very high degree, things like that. But they were also too busy looking at compliance. 
And they had a network diagram that looked very similar to this. Uh, it's scrubbed and also a little bit higher level than what they had. Yeah, very flat network. Uh, but the cardholder data environment's separate. But the problem was, let's say they have customers in Louisiana, Missouri, Arkansas, South Carolina, Florida, and Colorado. Well, they all VPN in. And since their network was pretty flat, any customer could theoretically access the file and print servers for any other customer. But since their CDE was separate, they were compliant. So that's great. We got our paper. Customer feels great because we have the paper. Paper's awesome. Paper will protect us. But were they secure? If we look at it from a different way, let's say they housed voter data. OK? They didn't, but let's just say they did. We have a bad actor in Louisiana who wants to get voter data for Florida. They know Florida kind of sucks at computer voter voting stuff, and they want to do some damage. So what they do is they VPN in through their state, are able to get into the file and print server for Louisiana, but since they don't have good permissions in place and everything's pretty flat, they're able to traverse the network and pivot and get into Florida's data. And chances are the customer isn't able to detect this, let alone respond to it. Another way to go about uh, would be to put in a VPN. So they would have to ideally have multi-factor to get in in the first place. And then all of a sudden, if they get in through the ERP of Louisiana, it's a little bit harder to get into the Florida file server because it's segmented off. So it's both secure and more compliant. So kind of like I've been saying through this whole thing, Security is going to trump compliance. It needs to trump compliance. We need to find a way to communicate this to our leadership so that way they can shift their focus from getting the che check mark and getting the piece of paper and instead focusing on actually protecting your sensitive data and actually knowing what your sensitive data is. And I know that... Uh, the previous example focused on networking, but it's still pretty applicable to things like application security and development. So uh, another common thing that I see is, um, I'm trying to think, segregation of duties. That's probably the easiest one. They, they say, oh, well, this guy can't transfer this code to this place because they have different user IDs. But what they don't realize, or and they have, sep or, no, let me back up. I got too excited. <laughs> uh, recently, actually, I had a customer say they had segregation of duties in place because even though the one developer that they had had full access in both environments, there was a firewall between prod and dev. But what they didn't know was that they didn't have proper ACLs in place, so it was kind of pointless. So what we need to do is take an action beyond compliance, because it's important for our security decisions to be focused on being more secure and informed by compliance instead of relying heavily on compliance and saying that's the only thing we need to focus on. So how many of you all are familiar with this? It's pretty well dispersed. OK, a couple of you. Uh, for those of you who don't know what this is, this is uh, Microsoft's secure life, uh, life cycle, development cycle. Um, and it's pretty good, right? It has a lot, instead of relying on the traditional security gates towards the end, it has security built into several steps. And while this is a good goal to reach, I'd argue that the majority of development shops out there will find it impossible to do all of these things. 
they don't have the people, the knowledge, expertise, tools, what have you, in order to do this and implement it fully. And so it's important for us to stop and take some time to think about, okay, well, we can't do everything and we shouldn't be expected to do everything, but what makes sense for our organization? What does our application need to do? What data traverses through it? And what can we effectively get away with? So first of all, you should always look at training, right? That's kind of like the first step. You don't know what you don't know until you know it. And then bring in your audit folks. We need to get a little bit better as security practitioners working with other teams. A lot of us are so used to being siloed and being pitted against others. Um, but one of the greatest things that I see is when I go to a customer site and I bring in HR and they get that moment where they're like, oh, I can be helping security and security wants me to help them and they're not here to tell me how to do my job, but they can make my job easier and this is how. So just trying to make things more, or I'm sorry, make things less adversarial and bring in other departments, there's no way that we can do everything by ourselves, nor should we expect ourselves to. So <laughs> it's really depressing, and I've been a lot of, this is horrible, things are awful, people won't listen to us, oh God, the sky is falling. So basically everything I told you not to do to your execs, I kind of did to you. So what's the next step? Well, what I would recommend you do is maybe Thursday or Friday after the conference, take about five minutes instead of refreshing your email or Twitter, or what have you, and look at the Microsoft Secure uh, Development Lifecycle and try to identify one or two things that you think your organization could realistically do or implement in one to two years and then how you're going to implement it or achieve that goal in that time frame. And then once you do that, try to push it out a little bit further. Okay, so what do I do for the next one to two years and so on and so forth. And then before you know it, you have more, you, you're better off than you were when you first started. We're so used to uh, fighting fires constantly and trying to boil the ocean but what we need to do is try to take things little by little and try to delegate a little bit also to other teams. So try to talk to your HR folks, see how they can help your developers. Um, Abe, in his talk, he made a really great point about, uh, sorry, I'm picking on you since you're right there. He made a really go good point in his talk about security reaching out to test engineers and uh, QA analysts and teaching them about security so that they can run some of the scripts that we create. Any questions? All right, uh, there's my contact information. Uh, I sometimes go on tweet storms about psychology and security stuff. Um, some food pictures too, that's fun. And then there's my email and LinkedIn information, yes. So my first point would be like, okay, oh yeah, that was a great question. Actually, do you want him to repeat the question? Okay. Just oh, you want me to repeat it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so he basically asked, how do we respond to developers when they tell us, um, why would we want to change what we're doing? We've never been breached. Well, my first argument would be, how do you know we've never been breached? Can we prove that we've never been breached? And then also I would argue um, maybe it's not about preventing a breach. Maybe it's about improving an aspect of the program by implementing some of these security controls. Because a lot of, and then uh, there's, there's so much to talk about. So I'm like, ah, how do I phrase this? Okay, so also we need to talk with them earlier on in this life cycle. Once it hits production, it's too far. It's gonna be more costly for our organizations in the long run to 
secure things or patch things once it hits production when we could have done it in uh, development or even in the uh, requirement gathering process. So if you can start talking with them, getting them training about things like uh, the top 10, OWASP top 10, right? And that's usually, a lot of times that's enough for them to go, oh, people can do that? Oh, there's people who do this on a regular basis for fun? That kind of like freaks them out a little bit and they're like, okay, can you talk to me a little bit more about this? Or if you can't afford a WASP training or any other training, a lot of organizations, especially the smaller ones that I've worked with, they have lunch and learns where they invite a developer to sit with them for a day when they do a web app test. And they can say, oh, see, this is how I was able to log in as user one and then open up a session for user three. Yeah. Anyone else? All right, cool. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you.